Yes, Robin. I think he came from the same place as me. The Beatles, Cream and Hendrix. Uh, it's interesting when you, you listen to music and you never really realise what's going to influence you as you travel on that journey. So I suppose I, yeah, the Beatles, it began with the Beatles and then you sort of move onwards to, to Cream and Hendrix and you always end up thinking, oh, which were the bits that were the best? And, and I think the Beatles just did so much. I mean, anyone who can listen to Rubber Soul and Sgt Pepper now, you realise they're just great albums. Yeah. They're just quality. And then you, you know, Disraeli Gears is still up there. All the Hendrix music is still up there. And, and I came very close to going to the Isle of Wight Festival where Hendrix headlined, but I didn't make it. And it was always a massive regret. I was in hospital at the time, so I didn't have much choice. But it was a huge regret that I didn't go and see Hendrix at the Isle of Wight. Mm -hmm. I wished I'd have seen that. Mm -hmm. And I think, yeah, the music just, first gig I ever really went to was, was the Pink Floyd. Mm. It was the Pink Floyd in, in Blackpool, in the Winter Gardens. Mm. And uh, there used to be a, a project called the Blackpool Technical College Arts Ball. And the first real band, I suppose, I went to see, uh, I was just sat there thinking, this is amazing, this is something else. But you don't realise at that time how much of a massive influence music will be on your life. You've no idea. Yeah. You just go, oh, this is all right, I'm enjoying this, and this band are great. And then I went to Manchester and saw 10 years after and Jethro Tull in a cellar in Manchester and then saw the Nice and Thundergraph Generator and Genesis with Peter Gabriel in a bar which held about 150 people. And then years later I found myself sat down with all the members of Genesis uh, in different guises, you know, Phil Collins one-to-one uh, -one or with the band, Mike and Tony and Peter Gabriel as well. Uh, bizarre way that music leads us into things and, and, and you never really think it's going to be an industry you can work in. I always thought I'm going to be a civil servant, I'm not going to be a work in the music industry, I'm not going to really love passionately what I do, I'm just going to do my job nine to five and then I'll just see how it goes. Yeah, yeah. and um, Fleetwood Mac and Brinsley Schwartz at Lauder Gardens in Sleepy Lytham. Leafy, well, it didn't start with Fleetwood Mac and Brinsley Schwartz. It started with Amazing Blondell in a church. A friend of mine said, do you want to get involved in this music? And I went, oh, that sounds good fun, you know. So we booked all these bands and had no venues. So we ended up with a tennis club uh, and a church. And it just worked. And then we booked Fleetwood Mac through a friend of mine and went on to book Curved Air at the same venue uh, Brinsley Schwartz turned up because we should have had somebody else. I think it was Barclay James Harvest. And what happened was Brinsley Schwartz turned up with Nick Lowe. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and what I didn't realise, and I met Nick Lowe a few years after, was that there was a guy who's become one of the best producers of his time. Yeah. You know, the stuff that Nick Lowe produced, and even Brinsley's. The Brinsley's then, uh, the hardcore of that, well, Brinsley Schwartz then went on to join The Rumour, which was Graham Parker's band. Yeah. And the strangest thing is, I used to book a venue in London, which was in, it was called Pub Rock. And it was in the sort of mid, mid 70s, I think, early mid 70s. And uh, I'm in, in London booking these bands, and he should walk in at Graham Park and the Rumour. And there's Brinsley Schwartz. And we did The Damned, we did a band called FBI, we did um, Vivian Stanchel from the Bonzo Dog Doodah Band. Yeah, yeah. We did Neil Innes, also from the Bonzos, all part of the pub rock scene. It was a massive scene in London. And bands that came out of it, Dire Straits came out of it. So many bands came out of this pub rock. And you could go into a pub and see a very, very good band. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so you promoted the tight farmhouse in Harrow, um, Graham Parker and the Rumour again. Yeah, yeah, um, and yeah. A whole list of other bands. Yeah, that was it. The Thai Farm was this pub that, what happened was I crashed my car. So I needed to earn some money. So I went to work behind a bar. And the guy that was running the venue left. Well, because of my contacts through the Fleetwood Mac and, and, and the leafy Lytham days, I knew a, a booker. So there's a guy called Bill Gilliam, who also at the time... I, I know Bill. All right, Bill Gilliam <laughs> then went on... His first band he managed was Sham 69. Yeah. Then when Bill managed Sham 69, he started Upright Records as well, with the Dead Kennedys. 
Yeah. And Bill became this legend of, of working with bands that nobody else really yeah, wanted to yeah. work with. And he had the upright records, he had alternative tentacles, uh, a great guy. And he yeah. used to get me bands. Yeah. But it was every Sunday night at the Tithe Farm in Harrow. Right. And I had like three doormen. One was Gypsy Dave, who turned out to be a fence for most of the jewellery thieves in the area. Another one was Big Martin, who carried a sawed off shotgun in the boot of his car. And another one was Peter. Now, Peter was about five foot eight, but he could lift patio doors on his own. And everybody was terrified of these. They were just great guys. But what I didn't realize till afterwards is that people are terrified of these blokes. And, and they turned out to be good friends. Uh, and years later, I'm walking past a shop in Soho and uh, glance to the window and there's Gypsy Dave who is now a star of most of the porn movies so he went from fencing jewellery to be a porn star <laughs> see they all the all the great movie stars start with me <laughs> oh dear and um then you eventually started to DJ at the rock garden yeah well I, I started I bought some equipment because the DJ I was working with at the Tyre Farm House decided he, he he was going to put the money up so it was going from £15 to £17, which I thought was a bit steep. So I bought some equipment and got a friend of mine to DJ, who happened to be a guy called Andy Childs, who was one of the founders of Zigzag magazine, mm. and then went on to do marketing for Jake Rivera and F Beat. He uh, went on to work with Red Rhino. He worked with uh, Rough Trade, a legendary, legendary man in the music industry. Mm. Um, and Andy was writing for Zigzag, and all I had to do was give him beer and two pound fifty, and he played the tunes every Sunday night. Which I, I bought the equipment, and of course it soon paid for itself. Mm. But but the DJ from the Tyre Farm then went into the Rock Garden because some friends I knew bought this venue in London, mm. and and the Rock Garden was right down near Covent Garden Market. They bought this old grain warehouse, and converted it into a club. So they said, Look, you know, I haven't got a DJ. Do you want to come do it? I said, we've got Jerry Floyd. He used to DJ at the Marquee. And unfortunately, Jerry died. So they went, do you want to take over? I said, well, it's not, not the best career move. So they said, uh, well, just come and work for us. Just come and DJ for us. You know, we've got bands and you can come and DJ. Um, and it just turned out that I'd, I'd finished my daytime job, driving to central London. They'd feed me. I'd DJ till two in the morning and then drive out again and start the day challenge on the following day. Well, um, anyway, um, uh, well, uh, who invited you to broadcast on the power radio station? Power radio station was poverty again. I went to, I moved to Merseyside uh, from London and because I'd been working in, in the rock garden, I was getting a lot of records that had on them demonstration copy not for sale. So when you're broke, you take them into second hand record stores. So I went into this record store uh, in Birkenhead. I said, I'd like to sell these. And they're going, oh, where'd you get these from? I said, oh, I used to work at this place called The Rock Garden. And they said, oh, well, maybe uh, we're working on a pirate radio station. Would you like to do it? I went, oh, go on then. So I went to work for this uh, pirate radio station, which nobody got paid for. It's called Merseyland Alternative Radio. What we used to do, we used to pre-record everything onto cassette. And those cassettes would be played out over the weekend. So we'd go into this guy's house and his mum would very often come in with the vacuum cleaner as you were trying to pre-record your show. And we timed everything so it worked perfectly so everybody thought it was live. So if you did four hours of show, you had to keep watch for four hours. So there was a, a junction on Merseyside. They're still there now. There are three tower blocks. And you can put copper wire between the tower blocks and cover the whole of northwest of England and most of North Wales on medium wave, which is AM. So, because the, the, the deep Department of Trade and Industry, they could locate the block, but they couldn't locate the floor. So there was one occasion where we were coming down the stairs with a transmitter still hot inside a cornflake box. And the DTI and the police moved aside to let us down the stairs, not knowing what was in the box. If they'd have just opened the box, they'd have found the transmitter. Mm -hmm. And um, you, 
were doing interviews about this time. With I did. I started doing interviews. My first three interviews. My first one was you two. Right. My second one was the Dead Kennedys, and my third one was Wilco Johnson. And and the U2 was, was just ridiculous. I did it on a ghetto blaster. And they had to speak into the mic. And I spoke into the other one. And I've got Bono just saying, oh, yeah, well, the edge is this. And, the, you know. and I'm like, thinking back now to sit in a dressing room in the Royal Court Theatre in Liverpool, talking to U2 on the ghetto blaster is bizarre. Mm. Absolutely mm. bizarre. Mm. Uh, and what was great about them, and, and has always impressed me with them, okay, these days they, they get slated a bit for having so much money and buying hotels, but they, they said, look, they said, you've got 10 minutes, they said, because there's some fans outside, they've been following us around, and they've been sleeping under the bus, and we want to go and say hello to them. I'm then thinking, well, you're all right, you'll do for me. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's probably the real U2 there. Uh, with McGuinness, he was an accountant. Mm -hmm. So, of course he's going to handle their money properly. Of course mm -hmm. he's going to make sure it works. Uh, yeah, and yeah, early days doing interviews, yeah. Mm. Pretty bad interviews, I, I would probably think. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'd really like you out there. Spoken by Johnny Walker as he offered you a gig on Radio Caroline. The words that changed everything. You know what says? It's a phrase that changed my life. That was the phrase. Yeah. What happened was I'd, I'd, I'd finished in London and I'd, I'd somehow I'd, I'd come back to Blackpool and I was recording some stuff just on a disco deck, on a cassette, and sending it to America, to community broadcastings. And it turns out I was very big in Salt Lake City. I don't know how that happened. And then Walker heard some stuff in San Francisco. And when he came back to the UK, Bill Gilliam again, oh. Walker came back to the UK, this set at Radio Carolina, went into Bill Gilliam's office and said, I want some records. Can I have some, you know, records you got, some noisy punk records to play on Radio Carolina? We're relaunching the boat. And, and everyone's going, oh great, this is brilliant. The stranglehold of the BBC is going to be destroyed again. It'll be in international waters. We're going to get our records played mm. because there was so much corruption with, mm. to get records played on the BBC. Yeah. And they were desperate to have free radio. Yeah. That's what they all want. All the record companies, all the musicians, all the artists wanted free radio. Yeah. So Walker then, uh, he went into Bill's office and Bill said, oh, I know somebody you should talk to. And Walker went, oh, I've heard of him. So I then came down to London, uh, didn't meet Johnny Walker at the time. I met two other people who were gonna be on the boat. One was a guy called Mitch from Washington. And another one was a lady called uh, Vincente from San Francisco. And we just got on really well. So that was on a Friday. On the Saturday morning, Walker rang me up and said, uh, hello, he said, sorry I missed you yesterday. Uh, have a good day. They said, I really want you out there. Right, okay. I said, so that's, you want me to go, you want me to do it? I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. I went, okay. So in my naivety, on the Monday morning, I walked into the civil service and handed him my resignation. And they're going, what about your pension? What about your future? What about, I went, well, the worst thing that can happen is I end up back here. I said, I'm going. And it was really interesting because most of the people from those days have followed my career. Really? And I bump into them from time to time and they go, I always knew you'd do it. And yet, when you start out, they go, you won't ever get anywhere. Yeah. And now they go, I always knew you'd do it. Yeah, it was Johnny Walker, he changed. And, and what was interesting with Johnny Walker, we went into the rock garden for something to eat uh, a few years after I'd left. So we sat at the table and the waitress comes over and goes, uh, what can take your order, please? And the minute Walker opened his mouth, she goes, you're Johnny Walker. And he'd been left this country for years. Really? That's how influential Johnny yeah, Walker yeah, was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. First guy to play Layla on the radio. Yeah. Uh, first guy to do so many things. Yeah. After a year bobbing about to sea, you, you went off to Red Rose. Well, it was a weird time because I went to join Radio Caroline and then it never went anywhere. Because Ronald O'Reilly is, is, is very frugal with the truth. He told everybody he had a boat and he didn't. He told everybody he had the money and he didn't. So what happened was I, I was sent to Spain. Uh, because I'd been in the civil service, Ronan O'Reilly thought I had a diplomatic passport. Of course I didn't, I just had a passport. So I have to go to his house very early one morning and Ronan O'Reilly is the guy behind Radio Caroline. Turns up in a sheepskin coat. That's all he's wearing in his flat, just off the King's Road. 
and it's like well I haven't got any money but here's your ticket to go to Spain and I'm going all right so I look at the ticket it's got Ernst Kuntz on it I'm going who's he oh he's just somebody we've been working with don't worry about it oh, okay so they never look at your passport and your ticket at the same time and in those days they didn't so I fly into Bilbao and in my ticket and in my passport off I go I eventually find the ship which is in a dockyard in a place called Astiello uh, just near Santander been on there a few days and uh, there's a knock at the door and uh, it's police and also I'm like well, you are uh, Commandancy de Marine you're under arrest why well it would appear Ronan had borrowed 1.3 million dollars off an American guy and only had receipts for the point three so therefore he's under arrest so there's me and this guy in Chicago on the boat under arrest in northern Spain and he he, he was balmy anyway but anyway so we're well, I said, so, so how are you going to keep us here? So they take us over to the window and they go, see that there? And there's a gunboat tied up alongside the ship to stop us leaving Spain. All right, OK. So there were lots of things happened, you know, we, the arrest and all that sort of stuff. And then I needed to come back for some dental treatment. So what I did, um, I went and bought a ticket from Santander to Plymouth. Just about to get on the boat and I saw an American girl. I'm carrying my records everything you know because I thought I was going to be broadcasting on the boat but it didn't go because of this slight hiccup with a million dollars so I see this American girl I said hey, you couldn't come through customs with me could you just do because technically I was under arrest I couldn't leave Spain so and I said look just hold me hand I look a bit starry eyed she went okay that sounds all right so we did I got back on the boat I got back to Plymouth got a lift to London then got from London to Blackpool and after a while, I uh, walked into Red Rose Radio and they gave me a job. Uh, I've been in Ireland in the meantime as well, done pirate radio in Ireland as well. Now, that wasn't as exciting, that was just caravans and having your transmitters chopped down and, and that sort of thing, you know. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, yeah, it eventually ended up on Red Rose and that was my first legal job. Mm. Five years of illegal radio on boats, in caravans, up and down tower blocks. And then my first legal job was at Red Rose Radio. Yeah. And, and did you go to Piccadilly after that? And after that, yeah, I was, I was at Red Rose. I started on evenings, doubled the audience, moved to lunchtime, increased it by about 125%. Yeah. Then Piccadilly came knocking because I got to know somebody there and said, Mark Radcliffe is going back to Radio 1. Um, he says we should talk to you. So I went, oh, right, OK. So um, they talked to me and offered me the job as head of music. So I then moved to Piccadilly as head of music and set up Key 103. So I did the, all the music in the early sessions and all that stuff on, yeah, Key 103 in Piccadilly. And how long were you in Piccadilly? I was there for about three years. Really? So oh. that, that, that was, it was quite exciting times because it was as Madchester was breaking. So a right. lot of the interesting bands were coming through. And right. The first interview we ever did was on, uh, on FM, because then the radio stations were both on AM and FM, was Simply Red. We split frequency and Simply Red all came in. Um, and about a week before that, I played some Terence Trent Derby. I said, oh, by the way, this is the guy that's going to blow Simply Red off stage. They heard it. So <laughs> I'm interviewing them. And they're going, yeah, some bloke. Well, I don't know what you're talking about, mate. I'm not, I know. Just, just sidestepped very quickly. Yeah, 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 yeah. But then, you know, then, then Simply Red uh, gave me one of the very, very first interviews. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and turned out to be a massive band. And where is Terence Trent Derby? Nowhere yeah, to be seen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then um, radio, radio, the UK's first satellite. That was a bit weird because I'd, I'd, I'd moved Piccadilly Key One Hundred Three was taken over, uh, and I didn't really like the people who were taking it over. They were a bit shady. They weren't, they weren't broadcasters. It was all about the money, which I know commercial radio has got to be but you have to make great programs to get people to listen to make money they didn't get that they were all about money 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 so I moved to London to um, a satellite uh, it was the UK's first satellite radio station so it's based in London and it would broadcast overnight from 10 at night or 6 in the morning to about 45 UK radio stations which was a big deal at the time yeah uh, and it was it was a lot of fun even though you had to throw your days upside down yeah 
I didn't do that many shows. I was music programming all of it. Yeah. And then I did some shows. Um, but it was yeah, it was uh, it was good fun. And March of Sound. After Radio Radio, um, you, you, I sort of left and set up my own production company and started doing the interviews. Then it's really weird in radio. You just get a phone call. So I got a phone call. I said, uh, "Sounds so here in North Wales." Somebody I knew, Ray, said, "Do you want to come do some shows?" I said, "No, I'll go on then." So I drove down to Wrexham, did a couple of shows, and the MDs in. Why don't you do breakfast? Why don't you come and do this? I said, I don't want to do it. I don't, I don't want to. No, no, you must come and do it. I was going to. So he convinced me in the end, and I did about 18 months yeah. commuting to Wrexham. And you get very tired. Yeah. Uh, but, but some days I would, I would do a breakfast show in, in Wrexham, 6 till 10, drive to Warrington, get a train to London, do two interviews, drive back to Wrexham late at night, and get up at 5 in the morning and still do another breakfast show the following yeah, day. Yeah. One day I worked 24 hours because you just got to do it yeah that's yeah. the way it is yeah and Jazz FM what was that and that was another phone call <laughs> Jazz FM came out the blue because I know nothing about jazz at the yeah. time yeah. I knew absolutely nothing but um, I did it because I just wanted it's a regional radio station so it was quite a big deal so I go to um, Jazz FM again get the phone call will you come and do something so I'll go and do it, start doing some weekends, then some more. Then I end up doing afternoon drive. And also at the same time I was doing my interviews. That was a lot easier with Manchester because yeah. it was an easy commute. I could get on a train and go to London very easily. So with the interviews, it just worked really well. Yeah. Jazz yeah. So I did five years at Jazz. Did you? And again, had a big audience. Um, and then started to fall out of love a bit with radio. Yeah. I didn't enjoy it as much. It didn't have that excitement or that appeal but the interviews did the interviews had the had, had the appeal because you could you could do a lot of research and you can meet some amazing people yeah yeah well yeah what, the people you have interviewed have been uh, astronomical uh, you know I, I, uh, uh, Brian Adams Brian Perry Cher uh, yeah it was it was an interesting time to say the least it got to one point you know where the phone would ring and it would be what are you doing Friday I mean well, I don't know well, what's on well if you go to Manchester airport there'll be a ticket waiting for you and if you fly to Zurich then um, a driver will pick you up and uh, you'll be talking to Phil Collins for an hour <laughs> oh, okay and it got that ridiculous in yeah. that at one stage I was working for every major record company some publishers and some film companies and it got just so big it was crazy but the, the deal was that they could trust me so if they're flying you all around the world to do interviews they have to trust you you know they fly your business class to um, Scottsdale Arizona which is where Stevie Nicks lives yeah and that's a tr that's quite a long flight it's quite expensive they put you up in a very expensive hotel and you've got to get it right you've got 30 to 40 minutes to get it right yeah, yeah. if you get it wrong you might not work again yeah <laughs> so the pressure yeah, is yeah. huge but you sort of the key to it is, is to let them know that you've researched yeah. what they do is to get them to trust you yeah. and get them to want to talk to you yeah. and if you get them laughing as well you're on a winner mm. you're on an absolute, and they'll tell you things mm. that they weren't I mean Robbie Robertson told me that he was working on a project with Eric Clapton the record company didn't know nobody knew and some of the things that comes out when you're talking to somebody in that one-to-one -one situation regardless of who else is in the room they just shut off mm. Mm. and you just sit and, as a one-to-one -one conversation mm. Mm. Um, and, and the trick is to have some guide questions produce it and reply to their questions all at the same time yeah. if you can do those three things at the same time you probably get a good interview and uh, you know uh, Cliff Richard uh, Sir Cliff <laughs> Cliff Richard was interesting because he um, I used to wear kicker shoes right and Cliff Richard had never seen black kickers he'd seen the red and blue ones and I had a pair of black kicker shoes and he went like your shoes where do you get them from so you end up talking about the most bizarre things yeah, yeah. you know I, I was talking to Diana Ross about kids and sleeping through the night 
and and it was just some of the things you talk about yeah you know talk to brian adams about cups of tea and things yeah okay most of these people they want to promote their products they want to promote their album or their tour or you know they are promotional interviews but if you can dig deeper yeah you get some fantastic quotes but you you did with uh, mark Knopfler and dr john dr john was great dr john was a labor of love you know to to be invited to talk to jo dr john at abbey road studios and as you check into abbey road you look on the counter and the Steinway man has been in before you to tune the piano and it was in the Beatles studio it was and I touched the piano that Billy Preston played on the get back sessions so to go down that narrow staircase to studio two at Abbey Road the Beatles studio and Dr John then got up and just played piano was something else yeah that, that recording has been playing that a quarter of an hour it's phenomenal yeah yeah, yeah. And, and a lot of these things you you really have to pinch yourself because here's this guy from Blackpool who went into radio for a love and a passion of music yeah. and you suddenly find people asking you to do things and you're going I beg your pardon and they go yeah we'd like you to do this and I went right okay I'll, I'll do it it's, I tended to adopt very much the Japanese I've heard I don't know whether this is true instead of ready steady go they just go steady go they don't even think about it they say yes to everything yeah. So I used to say yes to everything and then work out how I was going to do it. Yeah. And once you've worked out how you're going to do it, the rest is dead easy. Yeah, yeah. And um, Genesis. Phil Collins in the car park. Phil Collins turned up for the... We had to go down to the farm, which is their studio. And we're down in, in the farm and Phil Collins comes in and, and, and uh, uh, Tony had already arrived, Mike had already arrived and we're waiting for Phil Collins. So he comes and he goes, oh, he says, man on the car park's just called me Mr. Collins. He says, nobody calls me Mr. Collins. They all call me Phil. He says, it's a bit strange. And of course, this guy was a chauffeur who had driven one of the cars down. And when you see Phil Collins coming across a car park, the chauffeur way to do it is Mr. Collins. It's not Phil. He's brilliant. Yeah. And, and Phil Collins as well, I interviewed him when he was going through his separation from his wife. Right. And he was running up and down elevators he was trying to avoid the press and I was interviewing him in in strange places and I, I didn't realize what was going on until he told me a few years later he went do you know why I did that and I said, oh, I said they were all over me the press were chasing me everywhere and he hates the word nice Phil Collins right. hates it because everybody says what a nice man and he is he's a nice guy yeah. and um uh, Jack Bruce Jack Bruce was, was interesting because that was with Gary Moore and Bruce Baker and Moore. Yeah. Ginger Baker, of course, um, uh, last I heard, he was heading through Africa learning how to play drums, but he took his Volvo, I think, through the jungle. He, he'd lost the plot of it, Ginger Baker. But he, he didn't get back on with Bruce Baker. The interesting thing was I spoke to Jack Bruce and spoke to Gary Moore after that. Um, and again, you know, when you, when you think, as, as you go back to the very beginning of this conversation, yeah, listening to the Israeli gears mm. and there's Jack Bruce yeah, 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 and then you yeah, sit yeah, down yeah. in a room with him and I'm listening to the Beatles on my Pi transistor radio and then sit down in a room with Paul McCartney that is really quite surreal at times yeah, yeah. and Joe Cocker you interviewed him four times Joe was the great thing about Joe was he he, he used to be a heavy drinker Joe Cocker uh, recently passed away but he should not have been alive Joe Cocker hammered his system. And the biggest problem with Joe is he was the most generous man in the world. He virtually gave everything away. He, get, he was just so special. And Joe would take the time to sit down and talk to you. Yeah. He'd ask you how you're getting on, how you were. He was lovely. And Pam, his, his wife I met in Sheffield a few years ago when he did a hometown gig. And to see Joe Cocker play Sheffield is a very scary experience because yeah. the atmosphere is electric and Joe was just to me Joe had one of the greatest R&B voices ever yeah. you know people talk yeah, about you know your Chuck Berries and they talk about Little Richard but Joe Cocker and I remember going to watch the film Woodstock when I was living in London I went to the Baker Street cinema to watch Woodstock the first time round when Woodstock 2 came out I was in my car in Blackpool it was a really sunny day 
and he came on and I heard the first chords with a little help from my friends and I just pulled over to the side of the road mm. parked up and listened to it and a few months later I interviewed Melissa Etheridge and I was telling her the story and she was talking about Joe and because everyone was very very fond of Joe Cocker yeah. was was talking about Joe and I, I told her the story and she went do you know where I was and I went no where were you she said I was stood at the side of the stage and I did exactly the same as you I didn't move either and she was just I mean Melissa Etheridge to me is, is one of the great talents that has never broken through in this country yeah, yeah. but Melissa Etheridge is oh special yeah. wonderful lady and you interviewed Meatloaf twice. Meat. He's, meatloaf was hilarious because Meatloaf is very opinionated. But that's what you've got to like about him. Yeah. And he, yeah, Bat Out of Hell 2 and, and one, of, one of the solo albums. He was, yeah, he was, he's, he's still a character. Uh, but you don't know what to call him. You don't know whether to call him Meat or Mark, you know, his real name. You don't know what to call him. So you just avoid his name all the way through it. And you just say, excuse me, and would you mind that? You, know, you can't call him a name because you don't know what to call him. <laughs> yeah. And Peter Gabriel. Peter Gabriel was, was oh, that was, a, that was a labour. I love that. That yeah. was, you know, I'm never going to get to talk to Peter Gabriel. It's never going to happen. Um, and then I just get another phone call from yeah. the record company and go, would you like to come and talk to Peter Gabriel? Ooh, would I? Yeah. And he, because of all the things he's done with WOMAD, I mean, he's not just a musician. He's he's yeah. he's yeah. just done so much. Yeah. To sit down and talk to Peter Gabriel is a bit frightening. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't think any of them have been frightening though. Really. You're a bit nervous. Yeah, I think McCartney the first time was a bit, you know. To listen to you, uh, do all this, and uh, you know, I, I, I've heard all the interviews now. It, it, I, it's pretty phenomenal. Phenomenal stuff. You know, the, the really interesting thing is it's very similar to what you do, as we've said before, you know, just because we live in a little seaside village in northwest England, it doesn't mean to say we can't do anything with our lives. Yeah. You know, and there are great writers in, in probably cottages in North Wales. Yeah. There are great artists in Scotland, you know, they're in Devon. I mean, you don't have to be in a city. Yeah. You can, if you get the opportunities, you can just have so much fun. And, and the mad thing is you get paid for it. Yeah. That's the bit I don't quite understand. Most people who give their right arm to sit down and get Paul McCartney to make him a cup of tea. <laughs> and you're like, oh, okay. It, honestly, it, it has been, it's been a journey. And the journey has been surreal. Uh, and, and, and I'm so blessed with, with everything I've had the opportunity to do, really. It's just been an incredible experience. It's been a labour of love. It's been fantastic. 